Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here with all of you and welcoming you to our Connect, Encourage, and Inspire live storytelling event. And we hope you're going to feel all of those by the time our hour together is through. I'm Michelle Tenzik. I am a stability leader at the Stability Network, as well as a board member. And I also am the CEO and founder of East 10th Group, a leadership and executive coaching firm based in the New York area. Thank you all for joining today to celebrate Mental Health Awareness Month with us. And thank you to those who have shared what mental health means to you by participating in our word cloud, as you can see. So many great contributions about self-awareness, uncertainty, community, self-care, love. For me, mental health means feeling whole and not feeling alone. I live with severe depression and anxiety. And I'm so happy to know today because of all the stability leaders that will share with you that I'm not alone. I love that we've called this event, Connect, Encourage and Inspire. We want all of you to connect in the chat. We want all of you to be able to connect with each other and with the, us at the Stability Network. We want to encourage and inspire you to know that you're not alone, that there are so many of us living well with a mental health condition today. I want to say a heartfelt thank you to our sponsors, Healthline Media, Johnson & Johnson, Psych Hub, Danker, USI, as well as our foundation support from the Jolene McCaw Family Foundation and JJCJ. And lastly, thank you to all our donors who have already given ahead of today's event. Our goal is to raise $35,000 so we can continue the great work that we do. Thank you to our sponsors and generous donors. We're already at 28,000, it's hard to believe. And I know with today, with your help, we can get to our goal. What is the Stability Network? We're a growing movement of people in the workforce speaking out about our own mental health conditions to inspire and encourage others. Our goal is to share real life examples of people living a full life with mental health conditions and very specifically, how we live well. Our network of over 265 stability leaders, that still just takes my breath away. In 11 countries around the globe, we're all speaking out about our mental health conditions to help ensure more people get the help, support, and care that they need. During the next hour, you're gonna experience our stability leaders live. It is a live storytelling event. And we're going to share our stories to open the dialogue about mental health and advocate for better mental health for all. We really want you to leave this event feeling a sense of connection, inspiration, and encouragement as you witness the power of storytelling and the power it has to change lives. I want to first introduce our guest speaker today. During his time in Congress, Patrick J. Kennedy was the lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, the federal parity law, which requires insurers to cover treatment for mental health and substance abuse disorders no more restrictively than treatment for illnesses of the body. And as the founder of the Kennedy Forum, he now unites advocates, business leaders, and government agencies to advance evidence-based practices and policies in mental health and addiction. And in 2017, he was appointed to the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. And he currently serves as co-chair of the Action Alliance's Mental Health and Suicide Prevention National Response to COVID-19, and is the co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Behavioral Health Integration Tax Force. I'm not sure when he sleeps, but I'm <laughs> so glad that we have Patrick with us today and sharing why he's a stability leader and why he believes in the work that we're doing. So Patrick, over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and for hosting us and to Catherine for all of the uh, great uh, leadership you provided in helping us uh, start Stability Network. Uh, you ran towards uh, the challenge and, and not away from it. And that's not an easy thing to do. I really, you got me by default. And that is to say that I uh, became a uh, leader in the self-identified uh, movement for, for people like myself who are suffering from both uh, mood disorder and addiction. Uh, but I have to be honest, it wasn't of my own uh, choice. I 
was a uh, coming out of uh, about three or four years after rehab, my first time as a 17 year old. And then I was then elected um, to the legislature in Rhode Island, uh, kind of with that as a skeleton in my closet, so to speak. I, I was terrified of what people would find out. And then sure enough, one day I got up and I found that my picture was on the cover of the National Enquirer. And uh, it was Patrick Kennedy, cocaine addict. And uh, I had that picture, which was, of course, not too flattering. Um, not like I'm an egomaniac at all, but uh, yeah, I was really disappointed about that. Um, so it was on every sh shelf in my neighborhood. And of course, I was terrified about what my constituents would think of me now that they knew I was a drug addict. So um, the, the silver lining in all of it is that my constituents were more outraged that the roommate that I had in, in rehab had sold his story about being in rehab with me to the National Enquirer, um, they were more angry at him being a rat than, than they were at me being a drug addict. So actually, when I ran for re-election, it was, uh, I kind of positioned myself as, uh, you know, you may not be all about me, but you sure can take sides with the people that uh, tell stories out of school, so to speak. So um, my, my neighborhood was a very elderly Italian-American neighborhood, and they didn't like the, the rats. So... Uh, I, I succeeded in politics as a result of that. I went on to be elected to the United States Congress. And then when I got to Congress, um, I'd always had an interest in this subject. And of course, I had externalized my own challenges by thinking that they weren't quite as, as bad as my parents. My uh, mother suffered from debilitating alcoholism and, and a mood disorder. I lost my grandmother. Uh, to these illnesses, a uh, um, younger age, and, and who was very alone when she died. And um, my, on my father's side, he had suffered from a lot of trauma and, and never kind of was able to reach out for help because it was so stigmatized. And I do think that his life would have been uh, a whole lot different with as mu without as much suffering if he had been able to feel that he could come forward. And that's what the purpose of the Stability Network is today is to end that uh, shadow of, of stigma and shame that keeps so many people locked up in, the, in their secrets. And, and as those of us who are in recovery know that phrase, you're only as sick as your secrets. And so, you know, I found it very rewarding to actually have been outed early in my life because everywhere I went, people knew about my story. I'd almost been known as, you know, he's the alcoholic, drug addict, so forth. And so when I'd go to receptions, people would come up to me and, and say, oh, psst, psst, you know, I'm a friend of Bill, or I, I know what you've been through. I'm there too. And of course, they knew me, but I, when I walked in a room, I never knew who else. Uh, had had a similar experience. and But for the fact that they knew me, they approached me and my life was so much better for the fact that they, that, that I could connect with people that otherwise would have been nameless, faceless people. So the whole point of this stability network and why I'm so honored to be a member of the uh, stability network is that we strengthen each other's uh, recoveries when we are able to support one another and where we're able to, in the light of day, be able to connect with one another without that uh, fear and stigma that so often pervades any discussion um, of these illnesses and how we all try to cope with them. So I am a big, big believer in all of what you guys are doing today. I'm so thrilled uh, to be part of it. And as I said, I I was able to get my name as the number one uh, signatory on this landmark uh, insurance reform law called the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act because no one else wanted it. They didn't want to sponsor a bill with the words mental and addiction in the title of it. But thankfully, uh, the worst moment in my life, which is when I woke up and I thought I had shamed everyone by them finding out that I was a, an addict, became a freeing moment for me. And everything else positive that happened in my life in terms of my work in this space was a result of that betrayal, if you will, of my privacy or, or secrecy by this guy that I'd been in rehab with at 17. So instead of uh, 
resenting him, which would be a natural inclination. I actually say my prayers and, and say how grateful I am that that happened in my life because it got me out of being so self shuttered in my own struggles and, and it pushed me out into the world where I could connect with others who were just like me and feel less alone. And isn't that what we all want in life is to be less alone and more connected. And there's nothing more important, no matter what your recovery is, than to have that social connection and th those bonds that make you feel less alone. So again, thank you, Catherine, for your leadership and Michelle for hosting today. I'm happy to be on the call. Patrick, thank you so, so very much. It just really is an honor to have you and sharing so openly with all of us and really emphasizing that whole part of not being alone because of what our stories can tell others. There's a few people I know in the chat that were asking about the landmark bill that you did pass. And I just want to uh, say it again. It's the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, otherwise known as the Federal Parity Law. And Patrick, we will forever be grateful for you for doing that work for us and for helping all of us in our lives of living with a mental health condition and in recovery. When we tell our stories, we take a risk, we really do, to help improve the lives of others. When we stand up and say, I am living proof that it's possible to live a full life with anxiety, depression, or any other mental health condition, here's what I do to take care of my mental health. And as Patrick said, we might feel outed or we might um, feel shame and stigma from our illness, but yet when we come out and talk about it publicly, there's so much good that can happen because it not only breaks down the walls of stigma, but we know it saves lives of those who may be struggling in silence. Now I'd like to bring our first storyteller, Michelle Young, to our virtual stage from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Michelle is an advocate and freelance writer she covers the intersection of Asian American identity, feminism, and mental health for NBC, CNN, In Style, NAMI, and more. She's a fellow stability leader with me, and I'm delighted to introduce her to all of you. Michelle. Thank you so much. 2011, today is my wedding day. And for the first time, both my hair and my makeup is done professionally and I hardly recognize myself. For so long, I did not believe I would ever be worthy of love, of happiness. No, not a girl like me who would never be thin enough, demure enough, or sane enough. Yet here I am, and the partner of my dreams is waiting outside to marry me. 1997. I'm 16 years old and the luckiest girl alive. I drive into the desert with the windows rolled down, the cool night air caressing my hair, and I can fly. I feel beautiful. Days later, I'm terrified and ashamed. I don't know what's happening to me. I am so scared. I can't sleep. I worry all the time. I don't deserve to breathe. I am ugly, fat. I'm despicable. I'm an imposter who somehow convinced all my teachers to give me A's. I can't do anything people expect of me. I want to die. It's either that or let everyone down. I don't seem to have a choice. Weeks without sleep make me believe that the radio is talking to me. The movies, they're about me. People have been secretly filming me. I'm famous, I knew it. I figured that out, but they don't know. And then, oh my God, I can't believe I said and believe all that. I'm the worst person, I'm so ashamed. I want to die. Finally, I go to my parents for help. A mental doctor, we can't. What if it gets on your permanent record and no college would take you no matter how good your grades are? And what if word got out? Who would marry you? It's too risky. Was this true? Would getting help spell my doom? I'm trapped in this loop 
not knowing why I'm like this. One day after school, my dad tells me to get into the truck. I don't know where we're going. He drives us eight hours across state lines to visit a family doctor, the relative of a friend, someone who could be trusted to keep things off the record. I am so excited and scared to find out what's wrong with me. So I tell the doctor everything, the radio, the movies, the not sleeping. And then I walk out into the empty hallway and hold my breath for my verdict. When my dad comes out, I ask, what did the doctor say? What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. You have an overactive imagination. You just need to get some sleep. Just get some sleep. Something I've been trying and failing to do for years. I could just do that we wouldn't be here. Four years later, I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I experienced psychosis for a month. I'm hospitalized and put on a mood stabilizer that finally works for me. I am relieved and validated that my condition has a name and more importantly, a treatment. All these years of suffering, it wasn't my fault. Now, nearly 20 years have passed. I'm 40 years old and have been happily married for 10 years. My husband and I are parents to a hilarious have seven-year-old child and an incorrigible but adorable rescue pup rounds us out and keeps us all on our toes. I take my medication without fail. I avoid alcohol and drugs, including caffeine. And with this dedication to treatment and wellness, I thrive. I earn my MBA and work for a large well-known nonprofit and later as a marketing manager for some of the most successful companies in the world. But up until last year, there's still a skeleton in my closet. I keep my diagnosis a secret from my colleagues, my employer, most people I know. All these years later, though I'm doing everything right, I still allow shame to prevent me from feeling confident. Shame puts up a wall in my relationships. I never fully let people in. And it keeps me feeling alone. I feel smaller and smaller until I can't take it anymore. That's when I go looking for a different kind of help. I discover the Stability Network and other mental health support groups. I find my safe place where I can talk about my struggles openly with people who understand firsthand. I realize that I can't advocate for myself or anyone if I don't first admit my own struggles. So I stepped out of my closet. My essay called, My Mental Illness Didn't Stop Me From Succeeding, But The Stigma Nearly Did, gets published on the HuffPost. I am terrified. <laughs> But for the first time, I can breathe. I am free. Living with a mental health condition does not define me. It is certainly not a death sentence like I once feared. As a thriving, happy individual with bipolar disorder, I'm in the majority of people living with a mental health condition, not the minority. So I've joined the fight to change the narrative. My 20 year old self would never believe that life actually works out. So I wanna tell my younger self and all those out there like me that life gets better, so much better. Thank you. Oh, Michelle, <laughs> you know that when you shared in our rehearsal earlier in the week, I just was overwhelmed with emotions and I am again. I'm so, so happy you found the Stability Network and you joined us so that you can be out permanently from that closet of shame. Thank you so much. Great support in the chat for you as well. 
We at the Stability Network believe that our individual stories are our collective strength. These stories can be heavy, but we do believe sharing them is what brings hope and breaks the stigma. I do wanna mention that our next story does share thoughts of suicide in the first minute or so. So if anyone needs to tune out for that time or needs help or resources, the Suicide Hotline and NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental um, Support Resource Groups are being posted in the chat. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zach Burton, who's joining us from Salt Lake, Utah. He is the co-creator and executive director of the Manic Monologues, a Drama League Awards nominated play showcasing diverse, true stories of mental health and illness to disrupt stigma. stigma. And he's been featured in the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, Fast Company, and others. And he recently received his PhD from Stanford University. It is my honor to introduce my colleague and Stability Network leader, Zachary Burton. Zach. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you, Michelle Young, for sharing your story as well, and Patrick for sharing with us. It's, it's incredible to see so many, so many out there and the support through the chat, because um, really that's, you know, that's what's going to continue to change this narrative is all of us here together. So thank you. Four years ago, I was catatonic. I was lying in a hospital bed in a locked psychiatric inpatient unit at Stanford University Hospital. A few days earlier, on May 8th, 2017, I climbed five flights of cold concrete stairs, desperate to end what had at that point descended into full-flung psychosis induced by an elevated period of mania. But as I stood there looking over the ledge of that garage, I somehow almost miraculously remembered words that my mom had told me when I was just a child. She had said to me, if you ever think about harming yourself, tell me. I hesitantly dialed my mom's number. And at four in the morning, she picked up the phone and my mom saved my life. My parents love me. My family loves me. They all love me a whole lot. And so a few weeks later, while I was still very much on the most debilitating roller coaster of emotions and self-doubt that I have ever experienced, what was I supposed to do when my dad called me and begged me to come home? Our voices caught Tears clear even across the phone and across the ocean that separated us. My dad pleaded with me to consider leaving stressful Stanford for the sake of my health. I'll take care of you here, he insisted. And so, yeah, it was much harder not to drop the second time. Not to drop, not from that ledge, but from my PhD program. And that was just the beginning. The residence deans, they too asked, are you sure you don't wanna leave? Just for a quarter or two, just until you're better. How could they understand that what was destroyed was not my will to live, but was instead my, my confidence in myself? Throughout those months, I constantly thought, maybe they're right. I should probably leave. I should definitely not be in a PhD program at Stanford University. But even worse was the deep-seated anxiety that set in, telling me, 
I'll never be brilliant. Heck, I'll never even be moderately capable. My mania is surely what allowed me to eke my way into such a great program, and I'll never be great again because I'll never be manic again. I mean, what was I supposed to do in the face of this profound crisis of confidence? Well, I went off my meds. And almost immediately, I wanted to drop again, drop from that ledge. But this time, I was psychotic and I was scared. I knew now, wow, this is really me. I need these meds because I'm crazy. Driven back to the meds, I spent a summer crippled by the idea that I would never be me again. I would never be that fun, energetic, carefree, creative Zach that my friends, my family, my professors, and my beautiful girlfriend knew me as. And so that was the hardest part. The hardest part was deciding day after day, week after week and month after month to stay in my program, even though every single cell inside my body was convinced that I did not belong. But I'm still here. And a few months ago, I received my PhD in geology. Only after my mania have some of the most incredible things in my life happen, have some of the most meaningful relationships evolved, developed, and started. Only after my diagnosis and hospitalization did I go on to co-create the Manic Monologues, which is now sharing all of our stories as a play, as a film, as a virtual experience to disrupt the stigma around mental illness. And that recovery for me, that rebuilding, it took time and it would have never been possible without our community, without this community of mental health advocates, without close support of family and friends, and also importantly, without the support that I received in the workplace from my boss, allowing me the room I needed to slowly convince myself that I did belong and that I could be a performer and contributor in this, in this high stress, high performance environment. And so it's, it feels somewhat strange to share today, but you know, not only am I thankful that I'm thriving with my diagnosis of bipolar disorder, but I'm thankful that I climbed to the top of that garage and I'm thankful that I was diagnosed because without it, I would have never found this community of mental health advocates, mental health change makers, and I really would have never found my purpose. And so thank you. Thank you again for being present today and to listening to those of us share with you. And I really hope that you know all of you in some way carry this conversation forward because together, we can and we will disrupt the stigma that surrounds mental illness. Thank you. Oh, Zach, just terrific. You know, what I just wanna say is, as you told us about climbing those concrete steps, I am so grateful you came down those steps to be here with us today and to do the work that you're doing with all of us. Thank you. At the Stability Network, we love to check in with each other, to build community, to offer support to those who need it, or may have had a similar health ex mental health experience as we have. So we wanted to check in with all of you. How are you feeling today? You can go ahead and let us know in the poll that is being put up now. The results are anonymous. We just wanna see how you're feeling. It's just a good check-in with yourself and this wonderful community. So we're gonna take a minute for you to share these results.
And so a lot of people ask me, you know, why is the stability network so important to me? A number of years ago, I found in a movement called the Truth Behind Our Titles, which intent with the intention was to bring down the walls of stigma. And it was the first time that I went public with my own mental health story. Unlike Catherine Switz, who you're gonna hear from shortly, I just wasn't able to get the traction to what I was trying to do. And I stumbled across the Stability Network a couple of years later and found my tribe. I found Catherine and the team and the stability leaders already out of the gate, bringing down the walls of stigma which is something that I am absolutely so personally committed to because I know that one story at a time can allow someone who maybe is listening even today to put their shoulders down and to not feel alone. So it looks like most of our audience is feeling pretty good. We do have a couple of people maybe not feeling so good today. And we're hoping that at least today you don't feel alone by hearing all of us. So thanks for participating. Additional resources are gonna be added into the chat again. Now, it gives me a great pleasure to turn this over to Peter Varnum, the Stability Network's board chair. Peter currently is the associate director for Origin Global, and he serves on the Lived Experience Council for Healthy Brains Global Initiative. He's hailing from Oslo, Norway. He's my friend, he's my colleague, Peter. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's so great to be here with all of you. And just to echo what we're seeing in the chat and what you've said, Michelle, already, these stories, um, they're so powerful. And I do work in this space every day. I have my own story, which I'll tell you about in a second. And I hear them all the time, but uh, their power is never reduced. And so I'm very grateful to be part of this community and here with you today. As you see with the Stability Network, we are training people with lived experience to share these true authentic stories of recovery of possibility and hope so that we can live out our mission, that this, these people are living proof that you can live well with a mental health condition. My own experience with mental ill health started when I was 17 years old and I had the first of four episodes of psychosis that left me hospitalized. The most recent episode was only four years ago, and at some point in that journey, uh, I came across the Stability Network and knew that I, as you say, Michelle, had found, had found my people. Um, TSN has helped me understand that those episodes of psychosis, that experience that I've been through, isn't all bad, and it's some, not something that I should fear. I've actually reflected more upon that and looked at it with a bit more curiosity about how I can grow from it, both personally and professionally. And it certainly helped me in this role, I'm honored to be the chair of the board of the Stability Network, but also in my, my own life as I continue to think about what's important to me on my journey. And my life's journey, like everybody's, is not linear. Um, and it's definitely better walked with others than walked alone. And the most important part of the Stability Network to me is community. But it's not the only part of the Stability Network. The stories that we hear today aren't just uh, about the, the therapeutic elements that people get as a result of uh, sharing their journeys from where they were to where they've gotten, but it's also that uh, there's an element of strategy to this disrupting of stigma, to this narrative breaking. And Catherine's gonna talk about this contact education philosophy that we espouse and that you're seeing right now in act action. Suffice it to say that uh, the work that we're doing is breaking the stigma. It's always been important. And at the risk of beating a dead horse that I'm sure you've heard a lot this month, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the mental health effects of the pandemic on society writ large, the work that we're doing is more important than ever. We don't know yet how significant the mental health toll will be uh, of the pandemic, but we as an organization are in a position to shape the answer to that question. We know that mental health conditions are manageable. You're seeing this with the stories that you're hearing today. So while, again, the work has always been important, it's even more critical today. With that said, I wanna thank you very much for your willingness to be here with us today, to show up. Um, we really, we're, we thrive because of the generosity of people like you who want to change this narrative. And I invite you to help us to accelerate that change. 
please help us reach that goal today of $35,000 by donating whatever you can. And you can see the donation link in the chat now. I also invite you to share the experience that you've, you've had with us today with your networks to help us continue doing our activities. If you've already made a donation, then I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if you're not yet a donor, I invite you to become one. Very easy, you can just click the link in the chat. As you can see from the stories you're hearing today, the support is very, very meaningful. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. I wanna to thank my fellow panelists for, for being vulnerable. Um, that's the most powerful thing. The authenticity that you bring to these stories is the most important piece of all of this. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Peter, thank you so very much. Just terrific to hear from you this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are calling in from around the globe. Um, we've already had over a thousand dollars come in, so keep it up. It's amazing. We need it to continue to do this such important work. Our next storyteller is stability leader, Jason Grant, also my fellow board member and friend. Jason is a lived experience consultant from the UK in West Sussex and uses his own mental health challenges to improve outcomes for others going through the psychiatric system. So without anything more, Jason, to you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be with you today. So good evening in the UK, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're calling in from. So I am living proof that it is possible to not only survive, but to thrive in the workplace whilst living with a mental health condition. I'm a child of the 80s, who used to dance around the living room listening into Chicago House and Detroit Techno. Back then, my mother was diagnosed with a severe mental health condition, so I never had the best start in life. As a child, being the eldest of five, I had to grow up very fast. I was cooking, cleaning, looking after my siblings while my mum struggled with her illness. When my mum went into hospital, us kids were either looked after by other family members or we were placed into foster care. I personally managed to make it through those dark days and I thought that I was one of the lucky ones. I made it to university and studied media and communications in the early 2000s. I managed to navigate the competing demands of academic studies, part-time work, and managing a student radio station. I graduated with a 2-1 and secured a scholarship to go on to a master's degree. The rest, they say, is history. I always thought that mental health was something that people brought upon themselves. I thought that people were weak and that they should just get on with life. I never understood what mental health was about, even with the experience of my mother. In 2015, I went traveling and my world as I knew it took an unexpected turn. I started having this feeling that people were after me. I couldn't go back to my hotel as they would find me there. I ended up walking around for three days and nights without sleeping, completely convinced that someone was after me. The funny thing now is looking back, if someone was after me, they would have been able to find me. At the time I was paranoid, delusional, and without any insight into what was going on. Knowing what I know now, I should have asked for help. I should have reached out to my doctor or visited a hospital. I thought that it was just a bad traveling experience and that I could just forget all about it. Unfortunately for me, I went traveling again and my unusual experiences returned. Only this time, I ended up in a psychiatric hospital. My family had to fly over to bring me back to the UK. And even with that experience, I was still in denial. About a month later, I was sectioned in the UK. Once I came back to reality, I realized it was my mental health that was causing me my problems. I came to a level of acceptance where I would engage with the patients, the staff, and take part in the activities in the hospital. This was my moment of transformation and I fully appreciated the struggle that my mum went through. 
I started to trust people with lived experience of mental health as I wanted to learn how to live with my experience. When I came out of hospital, like most people, I wanted to keep my experience private in the first instance and just move on with my life. So I moved to Glasgow and studied for another master's degree. I had a great time in Scotland, but we had to move back down south to be close to the family. I got a job as a mental health community partner working for the Department of Work and Pensions, where I trained over 500 members of staff to fully understand the importance of mental health and how best to support people to get back into the workplace. I then became a research associate at the University of Manchester, where we were working on a study exploring the ethnic inequalities in severe mental illness. Then the global pandemic hit. In that first moment, I was scared. I was fearful that I would have another episode and thought that all of my hard work would come to an end. Fortunately for me, I found a part-time job as a peer support worker for an early intervention service, supporting people with a first episode of psychosis. I then stumbled across the stability network and discovered that there were people like me living and working well with mental health conditions around the world. Being part of the network helped me to keep moving forward, even throughout the latest lockdown restrictions. There is something beautiful in knowing that there are others going through a similar experience without giving up on hope. I am so glad that I discovered people like me during this pandemic, and I would encourage you to join the Stability Network if you too need a supportive community to help you with your mental health experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Jason, oh, you just take my breath away. I am so happy that we have you as part of our tribe and that the audience got to hear your story today. I'm not gonna give a big lengthy introduction to this next person because I don't believe she needs anything more than for all of you to know that she is our executive director and our fearless leader and the founder of the Stability Network, Catherine Switz. Catherine. Thank you, Michelle, so much. The Stability Network started with the belief that doing just what we're doing today, taking the risk to share our mental health stories publicly and how we stay healthy could change and save lives. We started with only four people in a room sharing our own stories of living and working with mental health conditions and realizing the power of sharing our stories more broadly and encouraging others to do so as well. That was nearly 10 years ago. And as you've heard, we've grown to 265 leaders in 11 countries, all people committed to using their mental health story to help others and importantly committed to staying healthy themselves. As Peter referenced, our approach is called contact education. And this is a theory that says direct exposure to somebody living a full life with a given condition is the best way to reduce discrimination and stigma. And that's what we're all about. But I should say we're not just about stigma. It's also about creating role models so that people who are diagnosed see it's possible to live a full life. As you've heard today, and as I can say from my own experience, when I was first hospitalized for my mental health, the doctor told me he didn't know whether I could go back and finish my degree or on to a demanding career. We never want anybody to hear they can't do something as a result of their diagnosis. And unfortunately, that's all too common today. In the past year, we've expanded to India, Asia, Europe, and Africa. We now have locally led networks in seven geographies. And by all collectively and individually sharing our stories, we're transforming workplaces and broader communities to be more accepting, supportive environments and helping others seek the care they need. We achieve our impact very importantly in a couple of ways. First, we recruit leaders and then we train and deploy them in advocacy opportunities, whether it be speaking engagements or media opportunities. Last year alone, we reached 50,000 people through speaking engagements and social media. What's our comparative advantage? It's in finding these folks and encouraging them to speak out and wrapping the support around them including key training that enables them to become change agents in their own communities. 
As you've heard this past year, we all know there's been a global rise in depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions. What that means for the stability network is that the need for hope and role models and effective strategies for managing our mental health has never been greater. Your support goes directly to meeting this need. So on behalf of the stability network, I wanna say thank you. Without your help, we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be having the impact we're having. But I also wanna say thank you to the stability leaders out there today and those who spoke. It's your bravery and your willingness to speak out and share your story, which is just so incredibly impactful. We won't stop until we have a stability leader in every postal code in the world. We want to make sure that everybody has somebody who looks like them to turn to for inspiration and encouragement along their journey. As part of our programming, we support our leaders to film videos of their stories. This allows them to have much wider reach and we're really excited today to debut a video um, and I'll turn it over to the video right now. My face was like one of those of athletes as they come off the field, having won a big championship, except it lasted for days. I was 19 in California, having won an international sailing team racing championship that no one thought the Canadians could. The beer was cold. I was euphoric. My crew barely put up with my mad behavior, risky antics, racking up credit card debts and speaking constantly. I cried nonstop on the six hour flight home from Los Angeles. I had no idea of what was going on. Mania and the fallout from that episode caused me to lose two years of university. Not staying on my medication prescribed to control my mood swings took its toll on my work life for six years. I was either unemployed, left jobs after a short stay, or was employed in positions well below my qualifications as an engineer. Depression was a recurring theme. My close friends kept after me to stay on my medications. Jump ahead a few years. I'm now married. Everything changed in one moment. I disclosed my diagnosis of bipolar disorder to my wife before our wedding, providing her with considerable amount of education. Then, two months into our marriage, a big wake-up call. My wife discovered I had stopped taking my medication. She laid down the law. Wow. That made a big impact. Way more effective than any psychiatrist's appointment. I've been compliant with my medication ever since. We celebrated our 26th anniversary recently. We have two grown sons. I retired from IBM Canada after 23 years. Now on my medication, sleep hygiene and exercise are important. No late nights. I walk a lot. We have a golden retriever. I've also completed a course in dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT which gives me more tools to help me stay balanced. For example, with shame, the urge is to hide or avoid. Instead, tell someone who'll accept it. If you see someone who might be struggling, ask how they're doing, or just start to talk to them, even about the weather. That may be all it takes to get them on a different track. If someone you think might not be taking their prescribed medication, gently ask. You may be the one to get them back on track. If you have a mental health condition and are in the closet about it, you may want to find one safe person to come out to when and if you're ready. Have a plan for this and mitigate possible harmful impact to your job, status, and career. The Stability Network can help you. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. That's incredibly powerful, and I appreciate your story. Michelle? 
Catherine, thank you so much. It's um, it always overwhelms me when I do something with you. I'm so I will for eternally be grateful for your founding of the Stability Network and continuing to make it safe for someone like me to share my story out loud. Thank you. We've heard so many inspiring stories today. I have to say it's taken my breath away. Between our guest of honor, Patrick Kennedy, to Michelle, Zach, Jason, Ian, all for sharing your experiences and Catherine and Peter. We do wanna say we know so many of you are trying to donate and we are so, so grateful that our donation page seems to be running into some technical difficulties because of the overwhelming support and love you're showing us. So please be patient with us. There'll be opportunities to donate after the event and we will follow up, so thank you. I wanna thank our event sponsors once again, Psych Hub, Danker, J&J, &J, Healthline Media and USI. So far, we have over $30,000 that you've all helped us to raise to do just what we're doing today. We come into organizations, community centers, and locations around the world so that we share our stories one at a time to help bring those walls of stigma and shame down and make it normal to have a conversation about mental health. There's still time, as I said, to donate, and that will happen after the event. As we know, again, we're struggling a little bit today, so thank you. There's also so many ways you can stay connected to the Stability Network community. If you're living and working with a mental health condition and you've joined us today, you can join us as a stability leader by filling out the application online, and I encourage you to do so. If you are looking, and that's on our website, if you're looking for additional resources to find support check out our website and read our stories for even more role models and inspiring stories, and then join our newsletter for regular updates. We look forward to hopefully that many of you will invite us into your organizations to speak about our mental health conditions because we know that one person will put their shoulders down and feel not alone. It has been a great honor for me to be able to host and moderate this event today. I have a lot of emotion right now and tears because I know for me, for my absolutely glorious stability leaders and all of you, we are not alone and we can safely talk about our mental health conditions and thrive and live our lives well. Thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to your engaging with our community ongoing. And again, thank you for making time for this most important topic of mental health. Have a terrific day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you so much.